I'm Kelly Samanoff at Parker Samanoff Architects, and this is part two of a three-part video series entitled Money and Buildings, a practical guide to church building projects. In part one, we looked at the question, what do we need? In this video, we'll examine the question, what will our building look like? Some people think that deciding what their church should look like is as easy as picking a style from the Churches R Us catalog. Oh look, here's a nice neoclassical one, page 85. Let's get that one. On the surface, it seems like an easy option because we all have an idea in our mind about how a church should look. Or we want to pick one we like, one that represents a pleasing image. But what are those ideas based on? Tradition? History? Nostalgia? A nicely composed photograph? Or simply what other churches are doing? We think that issues of style and image are too short term. Style should be reserved for clothing, fashion, advertising, graphic design, home decorating, and even car design, but not architecture. Buildings last a long time, longer than the quickly changing pace of style. We think style and architecture happens best in retrospect, as historians look back to classify buildings of a certain period. So how do you decide what your church should look like? It's a big question, since your building will be around for a long time, decades even. We believe that the look of your building should be a direct result of your ministry objectives. R.C. Sproul said that architecture can promote or hinder our sense of the presence of God. It's amazing to think that your church building can actually tell people about the attributes of God himself. Your building is also an advertisement, a billboard of what you're about, and it will speak for years to come. Do you want to appear welcoming? Then your building should be approachable, visible, easily accessible, and transparent. Don't build a dominating, solid, impenetrable fortress. Are you informal, casual? Then your building should reflect that. Stay away from formal geometry and classical plan layouts. Are you traditional, formal? Then your building should speak about that. Consider the role of symbols and icons, crosses, steeples, geometry and symmetry, the golden ratio. During the design stage, we consider the building's orientation on its site. Most buildings have a front and a back, but the layout of the site could force you to rethink which way the building should be placed. For instance, does the front entrance face the main road? There may be other site constraints, such as vehicle access, that would make this difficult. We also pay attention to where the sun is during the day in relation to the various building elements. One church we attended was located in such a way that glare from the sunrise at a particular time of year made the lobby virtually unusable. Rooms with west-facing windows tend to overheat in the spring and fall because it's difficult to shade them properly. So we ask, how can we design your church in such a way that the sunlight is used to the best advantage? The exterior finish of your church is an important thing to consider, and again it's often a matter of balancing wishes with budget. The primary function of the exterior cladding surface is to keep out the water, so it has to be durable and designed in such a way as to keep the water out. But it also has to look good. So go back to your ministry objectives and see what message you're trying to communicate to the people. If you're traditional, you might want to consider stone or brick. A more casual congregation may be fine with stucco or siding, or some combination of the two. Same with color selection. A complementary scheme or contrasting. Trendy or neutral. Again, refer back to your ministry objectives. What is your message? Architects sometimes talk about massing. Imagine your building as a single chunk of white material without any details to distract you. A simple block. That's what we refer to as massing. It's the overall feel, the perceived weight of the building. Is it a single large volume or a series of smaller chunks? Does it feel large and imposing or thin and weak? Would you feel intimidated next to it or does it feel comfortable as you approach? We can manipulate the building elements to directly influence the user experience. These are the design decisions that influence the final look of the building. What about the issue of a dedicated sanctuary versus a multi-purpose auditorium? Few questions generate more discussion during the design stage than this one. When it comes to the idea of a sanctuary, many people feel it needs to be dedicated solely to worship, and they don't really understand the concept of a multi-purpose worship space. Multi-purpose worship space does not mean using a gym for worship but using a worship space for other activities. This is an important distinction. Some characteristics of a multi-purpose auditorium are a flat or tiered floor, chairs rather than pews or fixed seating, and extensive multimedia equipment. The space can then be used for a variety of activities that require changes in the seating arrangement, 
such as seminars, dinners, meetings, concerts, children's and youth events. Multipurpose worship space does not mean space that does not complement and enhance the worship experience. Gym interiors are not usually very attractive, and if it is assumed that multipurpose worship spaces look like gyms, then of course the look of the space will not enhance the worship experience. For a room to accommodate sports, you'll need to pay attention to interior wall surfaces, lighting and ceiling height, but it doesn't have to look like a gym. Custom-made carpet tiles with sports lines are now available if necessary. Platform areas and chancels can be designed so that they are set into the side walls and look like a normal worship space, but can be cordoned off during other activities. Other room features such as windows, ceilings, and finishes can all be designed to complement worship and still allow for other uses. Another major discussion will revolve around the idea of natural light versus artificial light in your worship space. This is always an issue for churches because of the desire to be able to control the light for videos and stage design. Some natural light in an auditorium is good because there are times when it really enhances a space, like for a wedding or before and after church services. Electric blinds allow easy control when required, and you can use a double blind system with one blind a solid blackout material when required, and the other a micro perforated blind that eliminates glare but permits one to still view the outside. We tend to think that the blackout blinds are unnecessary. Perforated blinds control the light well enough so as not to adversely impact the stage lighting or video projection. The best way to decide is to experience a room like this for yourself firsthand. It also depends on where exactly the windows are located. If you want windows immediately adjacent to the platform, they probably would need to be blackout. In either case, windows or no windows, it will affect the look of your building since the worship space will be a large part of your facility. We've discussed many elements that help answer the question, what will it look like? So don't feel that you need to have to pick a look, an image or a style. Simply be confident about what your ministry is about and let your architect translate those ideas into built form. Always ask, does this feature reinforce what we're about? Our job is to work with you to find the right solution. In the next video, we will be discussing what will it cost? For more information, contact David Parker or Kelly Semenoff at parkersemenoff.com.